today we're going to cover a lot of the technical information about how you actually get someone started on inclusive skating. And for people that love skating, I think this is the best part of the onboarding process. So I actually think we've left the best to the last, if you know what I mean. And on the call today, we've actually got Olivia Bell, who's been helping me over the last couple of days, format and present the, the Badge Schools programme in such a way that we've actually got booklets. So this will be the first time that they've actually been shared publicly today. So that's where we're going to start, okay? So if you give me a couple of seconds, I'm going to share screen and we're going to go to this page, right? And what you can see now on the Badge and Skills pr Programme website page is we've got the Badge Skills and Test Programme, which I think I may have mentioned in the past, but now we've actually got booklets which are actually available for people. And that actually starts to make a lot more sense of what we actually do on the ice. So I'm going to click on the average one because the average one is probably easier. To get started with, right? Now, this resource is designed in such a way that it can be printed as a booklet. So if you were going to print this as a booklet, you would select print and you would ask for it to be done double-sided, but you would make sure that you set your settings for short side binding. So then it would be a little document that would fold over. And that's the inside two pages, and that's the back two pages. So it means that the person with average support needs um, has got their little document and they can put their name on it. That's the front page, and it gives the link to the website as well. And the inside page, which is the first one, would be this preparation then the activity, and then it takes them on to what they can do next. And that starts to make sense of what's actually involved in the, the typical inclusive skating journey for a beginner skater. So some of it I've already covered with you because we've got the preparation phase, which is the off ice skills program. And that effectively gives a protocol for how you should actually approach inclusive skating. So, for example, the person would be asked to create a profile on the platform, verify their email and go to registration. They provide the details and complete the registration on the platform. And importantly, they also participate in a risk assessment. Now, some of the people who've got high additional needs may in actual fact benefit from actually having certificates for each one of those stage, stages because it's really quite a challenge. So as they as you implement those activities, you can tick them off at the little tick boxes. And if they complete that stage, then you've also got the option of giving them a badge if you so wish. If you're dealing with someone that's got quite high support needs, the second badge makes even more sense. In fact, today I was having a conversation with someone who's got um, a person at their local rink who's got brittle bone disease and that they want to be able to take them skating. So let's just imagine that we're advising this skater with brittle bone disease, how they're actually going to go through the, the process. Now, immediately what we've actually done by having them go through a risk assessment, we've actually identified the possibility that they've got brittle bone disease. And I'm thinking about whether or not they should skate at all. I was assured by the person that they've been involved in skiing and they've done sit skiing and that they're still mobile and they're not in a wheelchair. So you think, okay, well, it's, it's a possibility. So let's see what we got to guide us in the badge number two. So we're going to identify a location or a suitable and safe environment for the skating activities. And at their local ring, that's what they're building up to, to make sure that they've got um, a facility available that would be suitable for her. And immediately decided that it's probably not a good idea to have her going on to a public session because it's probably going to be a very much higher risk of there being people knocking her around. So you're immediately thinking that this person should go on to a fairly quiet session and that people that are likely to bump into her or knock her over should not actually be on the on the ice at the same time as this person. And that's what's meant by having a safe environment. Ensure that there's available skating boots that are safe for, for this skater to use. Now, if they've got brittle bone disease, it's quite possible that the boots might be too heavy. So you're gonna to have to be careful that to make sure that the boots themselves, when you're putting them on and that you're wearing them, that they're not too tight, that they're actually suitable for this person and they're not too heavy and that they're not actually going to cause any breakages in the bones themselves. Then the third, aspect of badge number two is ensure that there's a suitable and safe balance support available if required. Now, whilst I was discussing this person in the earlier session, 
we actually looked at the potential equipment. And of course, there's lots of different types, which you can actually find on the website under the equipment section. And there were three, potentially four possible options for this person to use as a balance support. Now you've got the one, which is the one with the curve, which I think we've, we've seen before, which has got the handles, that's a possibility. But the person would need to be um, quite, they would need to be in a, a quiet environment and you would need to be sure that they weren't going to fall and that it was okay for them to fall. So that would require an assessment with their own medical team. The second option was um, a, a harness type, the, the, the Lecky My Walker, which would, is one which could be used by several different people where the person's effectively standing, but the harness would actually hold them in place. Now that type of equipment is probably quite good if the person's not going to have any problems with the harness on their body, but someone with brittle bones disease, you would need to be careful that the, that the harness itself wasn't going to cause damage to the individual by the, the pulling action of the harness. And if, if it was proved to be too dangerous and you would ask the medical team's help on that to see whether or not that was a suitable piece of equipment for this particular person, you wouldn't use it if it wasn't suitable. You would then consider there's another more complicated one, which is one that has got a slight sitting capacity that the person is then supported from in underneath and that it's individual bespoke to that individual's requirements. That piece of kit is more expensive. As of October 2019, it costs costs $2,300. So it's quite a bit of an outlay for an individual person, particularly for a growing child. But if that's the only way that that person can actually participate, then that's what you might need to think about. There's also the possibility of portable harnesses, but I would need to, be, again, be very sure that the person could actually absorb the weight and um, that the, there was a harness available, you know, that, that was suitable for that person. We've got them at some of the local rinks because they're used as jump harnesses. But again, it would be subject to whether or not that was actually suitable for that particular person. So for someone that's got high support needs, that badge number two and that off-ice work is quite involved. There's quite a lot going before you actually get them onto the ice. So if you've gone through all of those different stages with the individual, and it, the mem this could even be an adult person, and you felt that it was helpful, you might even award them um, a certificate because that's quite a complicated process for them. Now, I'm not going to go through each of these individual badges because um, I think I've done them with you in the past. But what they're basically doing is they're assessing movement range and ability to balance of the individual. And it gives you the possibility to decide whether or not this person is going to be effectively operating at one of the different tiers. Tier one effectively is available for them on ice and it would take them from doing this prep preparation work to doing the on ice activity the average inclusive skater would normally move to tier two that's the most common that's where the majority of the skaters end up but you could have also skaters who have got low support needs for example those that are deaf with poor communication problems or you could have people that are visually impaired and for them the tier three would be very suitable so let's assume that you've actually gone through all of your tier one and then you're going to go on to the activities that are tier two. And the thing that is really key to the assessment of the skater being at tier two is the fact that they're likely to be balanced very, very much on two feet. And that they are probably going to have some level of support, particularly in the in the early stages. But for tier two, you would normally expect that by the end of it, that they would be able to move independently without any actual assistance. But the balance is very likely to remain within the, the two feet. Um, so if they were standing on two feet, this, the balance point is very much within the center of those two feet, that they've not really got the ability to stand and spend a lot of time on one foot. And you can assess that through the preparation phase and that's if you've decided that they're likely to spend a lot of time on two feet, then that's where you would probably start them. So any questions on that, first of all? That all makes sense. Right. Okay, okay. So what you see within the badges is, first of all, that there's not a requirement at badger number one for them to fall over and pick themselves up. 
that knowledge is more that they've actually got to demonstrate that they've got this knowledge before they go on the ice. But falling and getting back up off the ice is quite a challenge for skaters of this type. And they often find it very difficult both to do and also they find it a bit upsetting. So it's not a good idea to make that as a prerequisite for badge number one. What you're really wanting to do with them at badge number one is just see whether or not they're actually going to be on the ice at all. So with badge number one, it's whether or not they can stand unassisted on the rink for five to 10 seconds. And for someone with autism, that can be really quite helpful because they can stand on the rink and just get used to the environment. And that can be really quite, quite a challenge for them. And so it rewards someone that has actually done that. And what the what we advise people to do is if there's someone with poor communication, uh, such as deaf or maybe poor response, or they've got a difficulty understanding instructions, make sure that you've actually prepared the skater for what you're specifically going to do with them before you get them on the ice. So there's a little tick box for you to do. So if you've done it with them before they get on the ice, then you can tick it off. Once they can actually perform the activity on the ice, then the coaches can actually uh, do a little signature to indicate that they've passed that particular activity. And this resource is available for the coaches to be able to download to download freely on the platform. And it went live um, about two, three hours ago. And I've been having a lot of fun watching what's happening on Facebook because we've even had people from Argentina telling me that it's absolutely fantastic and that they want to implement the programme. <laughs> which is, I'm, to be honest, I'm quite thrilled about, hey-ho, you know, we've got to take our, like, <laughs> little, little things that we enjoy as, as we're, you know, experiencing them. So those are the activities that they, that they do. The standing still, the knee dip standing still is really important because a lot of the skaters with uh, an intellectual challenge find the concept just of bending their knees quite a challenge. You know, you say to them, bend your knees, and they don't know actually what you're talking about. So what we're doing when we're asking them to do a knee dip standing still is to introduce the concept of them bending their knees and just get them to do it standing still so that you're actually achieving the communication of what that is before you actually get them to, to move forward. So once you've got them standing, they know how to bend their knees because you've asked them to do a knee dip standing still. Then you can ask them to march forward. And at this stage, they get the reward of the certificate if they can go forward roughly about one meter. So we're really just wanting them to move, you know, at all, uh, it, either independently or with a balance frame. Either of them is absolutely fine. At badge number two, then introduce the concept of them being able to pick themselves up so they fall and stand up assisted or unassisted safely. The second one, swizzles movement standing still. So again, this is to teach the concept that the feet are going to be turned out and then turned in. And that for someone that's got an intellectual challenge can be really quite difficult because you're actually introducing the concept of what the word out means and what the word in means. And that can be something that they find it quite difficult to understand. So if you've covered the swizzle movement standing still, and you've taught them to have their feet turned out, and you've also told them what it means to have the, their toes turned in, then you can deal with that concept without them actually moving so that you know that they understand what that actually means. Once they can do that, then you can then ask them to march across the ice for three to five meters because they've got a better understanding of the penguin position and that they're going to keep their feet turned out. Badge number three then takes them onto a two foot glide for three to five. And seconds. again, that's just them being able to skate on two feet for a couple of seconds to make sure that they understand the concept of being able to move while standing still. Then we also introduce the swizzles movement whilst moving and the forward glide uh, and bending their knees and again that's just taking what you've already told them standing still and you've taken it to the next level which is with them moving and the forward glide again is building up on the fact that you've actually covered the knee dip standing still and then you take it to badge three with them moving and that process is reflected all the way through all of the different activities it's introduced at an earlier standing still level very often with preparation of what they're going to do off the ice onto the ice standing still and then into movement and then the movement will also change as well badge number four we're going to introduce the concept of a stop but we don't do it straight away 
what we're going to ask them to do is do a two foot glide for one meter and then wait until the glide stops. And that's what a lot of them do. They don't have the ability in the early stage to do both things at the same time. Someone that is a faster progressor will be able to do it, but the ones that are uh, have got average inclusive skating support needs will benefit from actually having that process split up. So they're going to be asked to do a two foot glide and then just wait until it stops. We're also going to ask them to do a backward wiggle or a march for one metre, and that's using that turned toe in action so that they're actually going to start to learn how to actually operate with their toes turned in. And that's really important because very shortly we're going to ask them to do a stop, but we're going to give them some time to get used to operating with the toes turned in. And we're also going to ask them to rotate one circle, so we're introducing the concept of rotating and turning. Badge number five, we're picking up the swizzles again, but this time we're actually beginning to ask them to do them one after the other. So it's being able to do them consecutively. So they're beginning to use them with some sort of like momentum. And bearing in mind that we've already asked them to do the, the swizzles going forwards. And we've also asked them to do the, the swizzles movement uh, with a backward wiggle so that they should actually by that stage beginning to be quite good at pulling the toes in. So most of them by the time it gets to badge number five should be able to do consecutive swizzles. We're also ask, going to ask them to do two foot glides rotating to the right and rotating to the left. So they're beginning to get that concept of having some control over the circle. Badge number six, we're going to ask them to march right across the full width of the rink. So they're actually beginning to get this concept that they're beginning to move more. And then that's when badge number six, we also ask them to do the full snowplow stop. But bearing in mind, it's a beginner snowplow stop. So what we usually find at this stage that it's one sided. And it's usually a bit slow, but it's beginning to develop. And then a two foot glide, rotating the arms to the left and then to the right so that they're beginning to get some concept of being able to turn in both directions consecutively. Badge number seven, we're actually going to ask them to skate around the full rink. One of the things that we've noticed over the years is that the skaters who are beginners, one of their biggest challenges is being able to skate around the whole rink on their own. So that's actually built into the, to the process so that we're actually going to ask them to skate around the full rink. And then they're going to be asked to do the stop again, but this is a different type of stop. Because they'll be skating faster around the rink, the stop will need to be a more active stop so that it's at a higher level. So they're, as you can see, they're effectively being asked to do a two foot gliding type action where they come to a stop without any stopping process at all, a beginner snowplow stop, and then an active stop so that the stop is done, but it's done at higher levels of ability. Badge number seven, we also do the forward glide and turn to backwards. Now, bearing in mind that we've already been asking them to do turns in the earlier stages, they've then got the, the concept of what a backward turn is. Badge number eight, then they've got the forward gliding dip for the length of the body. So they're beginning to do that bending action, but they're beginning to be gliding at the same time. A forward one foot glide. So we're now beginning to explore whether or not they're actually beginning to develop some ability to skate on one foot. And that's really good to be able to assess whether or not they've actually got any discrepancy between the right and the left side. And if they can start to do that, then they should also then be able to start doing some sort of a little job jump on the ice as well but at this stage only ask them to do it at a standstill to make sure that they've actually got some control badge number nine they've then got a two foot glide for a half circle clockwise and counterclockwise and that's building up on that skill that we had, had done earlier at badge number five where they do the two foot glide rotating arms to the left for a quarter of a circle to the right and also to the left Badge number nine, we also want to ask them to do forward skating with a push from the right leg and the left leg. So that's building up the ability to skate on both legs. And badge number 10, two foot turn from forwards to backwards whilst moving. So it's, again, it's an active one. When they had done the, the forwards glide and turn to backwards, often what happens in the earlier stages of that movement is that they stop. But that's fine. As long as they've turned to backwards, that's fine. But by badge number 10, you want to see whether or not they can actually keep themselves going backwards. And we want them then to also be able to do backwards swizzles whilst moving and a beginner jump whilst moving. So they're beginning to come to the end of that process. Okay. Then we go on to what's next. Now, one of the things that we find with uh, a lot of the volunteers and the coaches and the people coming into it is that we've got so many things on offer that they don't know what 
you know, what to choose from. So what we've got here in the what's next, which is effectively on the back page of the booklet, is the events that would be suitable for someone with average support needs to then move on to. And the one of the most common places to start would be the compulsory elements. And you can see they've got forward swizzles for a distance of 10 metres, backward swizzles, and a one foot forward snowplow stop. And if they've completed the badge programme, then they should be able to do that. But you can see that the distance is longer than what was specified in the badge programme, so that it is a progression upwards, but it's one that is, is and should be achievable for them. If they're not at this stage of being able to put together a program, then we've got this free elements event as well, where they can take three elements from the level one program and they can actually just perform them. And these could actually be done on the ice in line or um, off the ice as well. If they're at the stage of being able to put a program together with some music, then they've got the option then of doing a level one free skating program with all of these elements um, within them. In the level one program, it's a one minute program with four elements. And that's designed on the basis that when we were doing the testing of the system right in the very early days, when I was designing it, that you could only actually judge one element within about 15 seconds by the time you've identified it, decided on a GOE and annotated it. So about four elements in one minute is about the most that the judging panel can cope with at a live event. So four elements are selected. Now it's quite possible that the skater could put in more elements than that within a one minute programme, but we're only going to evaluate four of them. And they're all got to be, if you look at those elements, you can see that they are very much two footed skating. So this is at a very different level from some of the other systems that exist. And there's a full range of elements that are available to the skater. Now I'm going to see now if I can jump. I can, this is good, right. Now, now this is in the technical handbook and it's actually on page nine, okay? So the reason why I've gone here is that this gives you a full range of what the skating levels are and how you would choose if you were the skating coach with a skater who was coming into you. And bearing in mind, this wouldn't just be someone that's just done the badge program. This could be someone that comes in and maybe they've been doing skating um, elsewhere. So it's, you're deciding what the full free skating level is that the skaters are going to be taking part in. Now the BHF stands for balance, harness and frame events. So those are all the skaters that are going to be skating with frames. And obviously if they're skating with support that they're likely to be spending the predominant amount of time on two feet um, so that they're not going to be one footed skating. So there's a range of events for them that are BHF events. And we've now got BHF one, two and three because the skaters that started off with us in the, the early years have actually progressed. So we've actually had to put in additional um, events to accommodate the skaters that have actually um, gone to BHF level three. But we find that there's a very strong overlap between BHF level three and level one. At that stage, someone even with cerebral palsy is even beginning to think about actually moving on to becoming more independent and being able to skate on their own. And what we've got here is effectively um, the guidance about the programme component scores that would be available to that skater. So the judges, when they're judging the events, use this technical skating levels guidance a lot. We've actually got this printed out uh, for the judging panel and we've got that there as a guide. So, uh, so that would help the judges to be able to, to work out the average of where someone is skating at that level, what type of range of marks that they're going to get. Within the Special Olympics programme, which is um, for the intellectually challenged and is used extensively <clears throat> in America in particular and in Canada, um, the BHF levels are not available because they require everyone to be able to skate independently. So if you're using a facilitator or you're using a balance frame, it's just not available to you. So we've actually effectively, <clears throat> if you imagine that's a Special Olympics programme, you've got the Able Body programme up above. The Inclusive Skating programme starts right from what I would call ground zero and it goes up through all of the different levels. So we go right down to this level. And the level one would be the people skating on two feet with balance between the feet. Now, the, the impact choreographically is that if you're skating with um, 
you're holding on to a balance frame. You can't use your arms. You know, it's really difficult. But we found that um, the skaters at BHF level three, because they're beginning to get a bit more control, what they are beginning to do is they're beginning to let go of the frame and they're beginning to move one arm and they're beginning to move the second arm. So choreographically, they are beginning to operate parts of the body um, with, with more control over the range. But at BHF level one and two, when they're more actively using the support mechanism, they've got no ability to use the arms at all. But at, B, at BHF level three and level one, they will be able to use the arms, but the range will be quite limited because if the balance is between the two feet, then functionally what then happens is that they've got limited amount that they can actually use the arms. Because if they were to try to rotate the arms and do everything, then the balance would shift to more one leg or the other. And at this stage, they don't really have the control to do it. They're more limited. If it was Special Olympics, we've got a problem because what they've done with the new program with Special Olympics is it requires a one foot glide. And when I've been attending the events with the Special Olympics, what's ended up happening is that some of the skaters were taking part and winning the event, doing a one foot glide, and they were skating from one end of the ice rink to the other. And so they were winning the event. And what that effectively means is that the skaters who are skating at what we would call level one, where they've got the balance between the two feet are effectively excluded from competition. So what we do is we provide guidance. So if the skater is performing a one foot glide for more than the length of the body, then we expect that they're functionally, that they've then obtained balance on one foot and they should then skate at level two. Does that make sense? So that will be quite a key thing if you're advising you know, a coach or someone else and they're trying to select the event, what you're really looking at is where's the balance? Are they on two feet? Or have they actually shifted over onto one foot? And if they're doing a one foot glide for more than the length of the body and they're really beginning to operate on one foot, then that's when they should be a level two skater. Okay. If they're a uh, level two, I've very clearly said their upright balance in one foot is what we're looking for. They are able to use the arms and that because they're on one foot, they're then able to use their legs as well in a limited range because they've actually got to the stage of shifting onto one foot. So if they're shifting onto one foot, they can do things like bring the knee up. They might even be able to extend the free leg a little bit at the back so that they've got some ability to use both the arms in a limited range and the legs. And in terms of the program component skating sc skills, you'll see that the range of the marks will then have increased because they're then in our world, have gone up to an average range of one to two. For the, for the Special Olympics, their level two, that's based upon the badges. It's not functionally assessed, it's based upon the badges. And what they've actually required within the, the events for level two in Special Olympics is forward crossovers. Don't know why they've done it, but they've done it. Now, obviously, if you're doing a forward crossover, you've got to be on an edge because it's not possible to do a proper crossover unless you're on an edge. So what's actually started happening at the Special Olympics event, people are skating at level two, doing forward crossovers, but they're effectively do skating as a level three skater. And the skaters that are truly skating on one foot are effectively excluded. So what we then say to, we're quite happy for the coaches to start early stages of the forward crossovers because you can see that within our program like in the badges you can see we do ask people to start doing stepping action you know stationary and then moving up to doing forward crossovers but if they've got to the stage where they're beginning to perform the forward crossovers on edges then we ask them to move up because that's them really then beginning to do what we're looking for at level three which is being able to lean on a forward edge and that's the key thing for someone that's different between a level two and a level three. Level three, not only will they be able to be on one foot, but they'll actually be able to adjust the balance that they're actually moving over onto an edge. And our compulsory elements ask them to do forward outside and forward inside edges. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that ability to lean and to assess it. And we'll be using that as part of our information about how much balance and control they've got and see what extent the central nervous system is able to control the ability to lean the body onto a forward edge. 
Now, if they can lean on a forward outside edge, then it also then means that they're able to use the arms and the legs with extension going forwards because they've got more control because they can start to skate around curves. And so you're seeing more of a choreographic range. So the average skating skill score, and I've been monitoring this now for 10 years, is within the range of two to three. And that's where the marks end up. If it was Special Olympics, they've got, uh, they've effectively shifted everything down a level or up a level, whatever you want, to, however you want to describe it. But theirs is based upon these badge levels, one to 12, and within the competition requirements, they require backward crossovers. But again, that requires you to be able to skate on a back outside edge. Now we will have done beginner backward crossovers at level three, but we don't require them to be doing it on backward edges. We're just basically teaching them the action so that they know what they're meant to be doing, but we're not actually asking them to skate on a back edge as yet. If the skaters are performing them on backward crossovers on edges, then we think they should be up at inclusive skating level four. Okay. And our level four is this ability to lean on back edges. The compulsory elements have actually got back outside and back inside half circle edges within the, the requirements. And what you'll also see at this stage is that they'll be able to use arms and legs with extension going backwards. And you've got a corresponding increase in the average skating score which has been um, getting rewarded for skating skills. The Special Olympics really kind of gets stuck. There's no further guidance. The badge program doesn't really operate thereafter because they just have the badge one and 12 and it refers, their technical requirements just refers to difficult jumps and spins without any further criteria. When we are assessing the skaters, we're looking for them from the purposes of classification. We want a lot more information. And we want them to be able to do back outside and back edges for a semicircle and also to be and or a loop jump. And again, you can only do a loop jump if you can actually skate on a back outside edge with control. And that's the technical quality that we're looking for at level four. At level four. At level five, the, the skaters are beginning to demonstrate the ability to change edge. So not only have they got the ability to skate on a good edge on a one circle, but they can then change edge and then move on to the next circle. And we've got changes of age within the compulsory elements level five. And we're also looking for them to be able to do back double threes because that takes the ability to be able to change circle and being able to control the rotation. And the technical elements within the program at that stage take the skaters through all the single jumps and up to flip. At level five, we've actually also got uh, the option of free dance because what we find at this stage as well is we've got some skaters that are very good on edges, but for some reason, for example, it might be brittle bone disease or a similar type of bone disorder where they really should not be jumping. They, they, they really shouldn't be having falls. And at that point in time, they get a bit stuck. So we've got the free dance as an option for skaters who really shouldn't be falling at all so that they could go down the route of being able to be this level of a skater doing these sorts of activities but not taking the risk of any falls and jumps so don't think that they have to do the free skating jumps okay it's more the fact that they've got this basic ability to control the edge and then but they should then be skating at the free dance level six is the ability to reverse and increase rotation on the edge so for the skaters that had done compulsory figures, you'll be aware of brackets. If you've not done compulsory figures, it might not be quite as intuitive to you, but it's the ability to work against the rotation on the edge. And similarly with the axle, where you're looking at the ability to increase the rotation across the edge on the takeoff. And if you're able to do that, then you're able to do the takeoff for the axle and you should also be able to do brackets. And that's what we're looking at for the, the level six skaters. So they've got full use of the body and they've got the ability to reverse rotation and control multiple rotations. And what you see choreographically with skaters at that level is that they'll be able to do quite complex movements and the arms will be able to take shapes and they'll be able to move and increase rotation so that you get a much more dynamic program and choreographic range. And that is on average reflected in the marks. And at that stage, the marks are going up to five to six and bearing in mind we're marking out of 10. At level seven that's the highest that we go up to currently and that's got all the double jumps and the triple jumps and um, we 
th there was one skater, Daniel Funnell from the United States, who skated and was able to do double flips and double jumps. Uh, but it would include people, particularly those with uh, communication problems, such as a hearing difficulty, where they really can do lots of double jumps. So the level seven is there. And what we're looking for from the skaters at that level is that they can both increase in rotation on the edge and also in changing circle. So that will include things like being able to do counters and rockers. So that's the sort of technical skating quality that we're looking for. And that would be reflected in all their jumps. It's taken years to work that out. Now I'm going to go back to the, the badge program, right? Because that's the average. And you can see the journey for that skater. You would have gone through, this is the average, and then you would take them through to the level one, which is effectively where they're on two feet. And the average inclusive skater will probably get about level three or four. That's where the average one gets to. Okay, now I'm going to hopefully let's see if this works. Yep, I'm going to go to tier three. Right, great, excellent. So tier three, we've got the same preparation system as we had because that's consistent through all of the, the the program and the activities. But then the tier three has actually got a much faster pace of um, ability. Now, what you would have done when you were doing the preparation phases, if you think that the skater has got good balance and that they are very good at being able to stand on one foot, then you want to consider the possibility of them being a tier three skater. What we find with the skaters that have got communication problems, particularly the deaf, is that generally they've got pretty good balance. Some of them do have a balance issue that does slow them up. So you may have to think about tier two, but often they'll, they will be able to have good balance and they will be able to progress very quickly. But the disability group that has got the lowest level of participation in sport is people with hearing problems. And the reason why they've got poor involvement within sport is they get left behind in the very early stages. So to accommodate their needs, what we are recommending is that before they get taken to do the activity, that they then cover that activity and talk what that activity is off the ice with good communication. We do have support available with individuals who are able to sign and be able to communicate with them. We've also got videos on the platform that actually show you what that, that activity is. So what we recommend is that you make sure that the person in particular got communication challenges knows what they're actually going to do before you get them on the ice, because it may be much more difficult for them to pick up what you're saying if you're actually doing it on the ice for the first time. So there's a little tick box there at the side that allows you to ask them, so to explain what it is that you're going to do. And once you've done that off the ice, then you can then proceed to do the activity on the ice. Once they can do the activity on the ice, then you've got this space here at the side for the coach or the judge or the assessor to sign that they've completed the activity. So let's have a look at what is included within badge number one for someone that's got better uh, balance and is likely to be able to skate on one foot fairly easily. So you're going to ask them to do a forward march to the middle of the rink, because for them, that's probably the challenge that is going to be more relevant to them. From a standing position, you're going to ask them to fall and get back up safely and unassisted. And you're also going to ask them to do the two foot glide and come to a standstill. And you can see that's a much faster pace that was broken down far more for the skaters at the tier two. But for someone that is fairly able, that's probably about the right level for them to actually to be operating at. And the coach can decide what they think is the right level, what's the right level of challenge for that skater, whether or not it's a badge one at tier three or it's a badge one at tier two. Badge number two, forward two foot swizzles, five consecutive. So you move them straight on to doing swizzles, moving. A forward two foot glide and bend the knees and a forward two foot glide and rotating arms clockwise and counterclockwise. And bearing in mind, you've actually covered a lot of that in the preparation because you know that they can turn to both sides. Badge number three, we've got them skating across the full width of the rink and a backward march for one metre and a one half turn rotation on two feet in place. So you've actually getting them now to start turning. Badge number four, skate forward and do a two foot turn to backwards. So that half turn that you prepared them for in badge three, you're then taking straight into badge number four. And we're also going to get them to do a forward gliding dip on two feet for the length of the body. 
and a beginner two foot bunny hop jump in place. Now that's done at badge number four. For the skaters at tier two, they weren't getting to that stage until they were at badge number 10. So this is moving at a much faster pace for skaters at tier three. Badge number five, backward swizzles, five consecutive. Skate forwards using both legs, because bear in mind, you've already assessed the fact that this skater is already good on one foot skating. So you're going to ask them to use that. So we're going to ask we're going to ask them to skate forward using both legs and do a one foot snowplow stop. A forward two foot glide with a lean into the circle for a third of a circle clockwise and counterclockwise. Because they've got the ability to skate on one foot, you've then already determined the fact that they've actually got the ability to shift the weight to one side. So they should be able to do a two foot uh, glide with a lean into the circle. And your average skater with uh, no additional knees will often be able to do that very easily. And there's not that much difference for these um, skaters with the, the lower support needs. They should be able to do that as well because they can skate on one foot. Badge number six, we're going to ask them to do a, a forward one foot glide in a straight line for a length of one meter. So we're asking them then to start holding the glide on one foot. And, and make sure that it's done on both legs, because what we're trying to assess is that we're trying to keep both sides equal. And you'll often find with, particularly if they've had any form of stroke, that they won't be equal. I would have expected that most of them would still be down at tier number two, but um, it, this stage might actually show additional weaknesses that you weren't aware of, particularly when you see, most people are one-sided a little bit, but they should be able to do one meter, okay? Um, Badge number six has also got the backward two foot glide for the length of the body. And it's also got the two foot glide with one foot performing swizzles. So you're actually taking them onto the circle and you're getting them to do the one foot swizzle action so that they're actually going to skate around in a circle and they're beginning that pumping action. And that's got two helpful uh, benefits technically is you're beginning up the ability then to be able to start building up the forward crossover, but you're also beginning to build up the action that they're then going to use backwards for doing the backward crossover action. So you're going to do that in an easier form by doing these uh, one foot swizzles on both sides. Action number seven, a backward two foot glide with one foot performing the swizzles. So again, this is the, the preparation for backward crossovers and consecutive two foot curves going to the right and to the left. And at badge number seven, we're also going to ask them to do full skating around the whole of the rink and a two foot snowplow stop. So we're looking for a, a proper stop so that they're not just doing it on one side, but they're actually doing it on both sides. Okay. Badge number eight has got skating backwards for three to five meters and a turn to forwards. A forward a forward one foot glide for one meter on a circle. So we're beginning to build up that concept of them being able to skate on an edge and forward skating with a full circuit of the rink, pushing on both the right and the left leg down the length of the rink. Badge number nine, skating backwards for a distance of 10 meters and a single forward crossover with a step on to glide on one foot uh, clockwise and counterclockwise. And bearing in mind, we've already been building that up with the concept of them being able to stand on the edges earlier and also the, the ability of the pumping action so that they've got some ability to turn the foot out and get a proper pushing action as they're about to try the forward crossovers. Badge, badge number 10 is the backward one foot glide, left and right for the length of the body and a backward gliding dip, gliding dip and the beginning of consecutive forward crossovers clockwise and counterclockwise. Now at this stage, we would expect that the crossovers will be fairly upright. So they wouldn't be skating on full blown edges at this stage, but they would, because they're able to skate on one foot, we would ex certainly expect them to be able to do some sort of ability to get the foot to cross over, but we wouldn't be expecting it to be on edges. So that's why it refers to as beginner forward crossovers. So if you were to be a judge for the skaters, if you see them just being able to cross over, even if it's done on a fairly flat edge, that's fine at this stage because it's only beginner forward crossovers. Okay, so once the skaters completed their uh, 10 badges at the level three, what's next? Now, what is different about this program is that instead of the skaters having to go in at level one, which is what you would do, for example, with British ice skating, what you do is you actually assess what the skater is like. The average person coming out of a tier three program will actually move into level two. They don't have to do level one. 
So just jump level one. Because they're already at the stage of skating on one foot, then take them straight to the level two activities. And when I say level two activities, that means for the free skating, the compulsory elements and the free elements. The free dance, in actual fact, um, it doesn't exist at level, um, what would be the normal level one? Because it, there's no difference in what you're actually asking them to do. So the level one free dance is actually very similar to what you would be looking for at the level two free skating and the rules actually say that. So the skater coming out of this tier three will then move into these. And this document then effectively gives the coaches a little bit of a synopsis of where they can go next. The level two free skating programme has helpfully got the elements that you would put into the programme. There'd be five elements and at least three of them must come from this level two. And it includes all the things that you've been doing through the badge programme. And for, for them to compete at level two, they don't need to have finished the badges. We allow people to be doing the a competition even if they're at badge number three on the level, you know, on, on tier three. For us, it doesn't matter. They can start to compete straight away as soon as they want. And there's enough flexibility within those range of elements for the skater to be, you know, someone that's in the early stages of going through the badge programme and also take them on for a good, uh, good year. What we find generally is that the skaters that are inclusive skaters will spend a lot longer at each level. Some of them might never go beyond level three. The skaters that are within this low support needs tier three, this group will generally be the ones that go on to levels five and six. Because they've got good ability on one foot, most of the ones that move at this pace go on faster. Right, I'm going to go back the way now and we're going to have a look at the tier one. All right, and it was lovely today because it's obviously just gone up on the website and one of the skating coaches immediately um, sent it to one of their pupils and one of the pupils who, uh, I, I know the skater because she's competed in our events and she's a balance harness and facilitator skater. So she's actually skating at, at this level. So this was actually a really nice way for her to sort of like find out that there's, there is actually activities that she can actually do. And you can see that Again, we've got the same off eye skills, which is this protocol that we would like people to follow in terms of introducing people safely to inclusive skating activities. And then these are the activities that they're actually going to do. The Autism Society have looked at these activities and they thought they were great because it really splits the activities up. So even someone with uh, autism that struggles to do some of these early activities of going into the rink going to registration, participating in the risk assessment. Now you'll notice that there's two risk assessments. You've got the risk assessment where we're doing the, like the overall one when they're registering on the platform and we're getting an overall sense of them. So you might think, well, why are you asking them to do another risk assessment? Well, that's because with inclusive skaters, they're highly variable and quite um, changeable. So on a day-to-day -day basis, they can be very different one day from the way that they were the, the previous day. So you always do a risk assessment every single time that they do an activity. So we to encourage that as being the normal process, we actually ask them to do uh, the risk assessment again so that you're building in good habits for how they actually have a safe system of operating with these individual skaters so that they participate in the risk assessment every single time that they actually go to the activity leader. For badge number two, we ask them to go to the side of the rink and be in the rink environment. And that can be quite a scary process for um, a skater that's got an additional need because you're putting them into a much brighter environment and it might take them a bit of time to adjust. You might need to see how they cope with differences in uh, temperature. And they could be doing inline skating. So it might actually then also be um, how they actually accommodate to being outside and coping with wind and preferably not rain, but maybe bright sunshine. We also ask them to touch the skating boots and the balance frame so that they've got some ability to actually to interact, interact with the equipment. And for some of the skaters with autism, we've actually found that they've actually spent a whole session just touching the skating boots and being involved in becoming acquainted with the skating boots. And if you split that up, 
and you're not asking them to put it on because sometimes remember a lot of these uh, children with autism they don't like the sensation of touching things it can be very um overwhelming so by asking them to touch the skating boots and get used to the feeling of them and touching the balance frame then you're splitting that process up and you're taking a bit away a bit of the stress away and if they manage to to do that activity then you're going to ask them to go to the next stage which is to put the skating boots on and then also similarly to participate in the safety equipment and put on the helmet and the gloves and hopefully um, if you've been preparing them by doing this off the ice then hopefully when they're doing this at the rink then they'll do it there will be a difference between doing it in the house and doing it in the rink because they'll be putting on the skating but it's not on their seat in the house they'll be doing it at a different height and um, sitting on the chair or on the bench in the skating rink the boots might be colder they might be at a different temperature that might not be something that you would notice but a child with autism may very well notice these things so these small things which may not seem like anything to you may be quite overwhelming to someone that's got autism so do take the time to split these activities up and don't rush them make sure that you give them plenty of time so that it's not overwhelming for them so that we can then get them safely through this stage of putting the boots on and getting the equipment ready and being able to participate in the safety briefing. With badge number four, we want them to wear skating boots for a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> you, you may well be aware, but if you've got cerebral palsy, it can take spastic muscle a long time to relax. So what we've identified is that the skaters with cerebral palsy, when you put the skating boots on, very often it takes somewhere between three to five minutes for the heel of the person to sink and stretch and eventually go down in to touch the, the, the sole of the, the skating boot internally. So by asking people to get the skaters to wear the skating boots for a few minutes, what we're doing is we're building that into the system so that if you've got someone with cerebral palsy, give them a couple of minutes to make sure that the heels come down. And because that's built into the system, you're far more likely then to have a skater with cerebral palsy who you're not rushing onto the ice. Now, the able-bodied skaters, they, they won't be an issue. They'll just have the boots on and they'll be straight off. Someone with cerebral palsy, no, you've really got to give them the time. And if you're giving them time, then you'll actually start to find from them during the conversation how long it's actually going to take them for the heel to come down and for them to feel comfortable inside the skating boot. Once they're inside the skating boot, bearing in mind these are the group of skaters with the high support needs, then you're going to look at the balance aid. <clears throat> if they're wearing skating boots, the skating boots will push them up an extra couple of inches. So several of the skaters with cerebral palsy like their own frame. And a lot of them have got super frames these days. They've got wheels and they can move them around and they love them. If you're going to use that on the ice, you may need to adjust the height to accommodate the fact that they've gone up a couple of inches. Now, on the, the ice skating boots, usually you go up about two inches. If it's roller blades that you're going to be doing with the skaters or in line, they can be even higher. Some of the roller blades, I've been measuring the height of them, they're up at three inches. You know, if you were having a look at the Snow White, I did a video on it a short time ago. So if you're having to come up three inches, that can really have a big impact on the, the balance of the frame. So make sure that you've accommodated for that if they're going to use their frame or if they're using, you know, one of our frames. At that stage, we also ask the skater to participate in a meeting of the coaches and the volunteers. And what you're trying to make sure is that you've actually got the right people involved who are going to be good at taking that individual skater onto the ice. And we've got a couple of people um, that operate in various hour sessions who are particularly good with kids with autism. So if I've got someone that's coming in and they've got autism, I'm more likely to say, Andy, come on over here. I've got someone for you. So you make sure that you're introducing the skater to the volunteers and that you're going to make sure that you've got a good relationship in place between the coaches and the volunteers and the parents and the carers. If at all possible, in an ideal world, you've actually got the parents and the carers on the ice as well because you've actually got them skating too. But, you, you know, you have to take what you've got. That, that's not always possible. So you need to make sure you've got enough volunteers. And remember, we always advise to have at least one volunteer for a new skater on the ice, preferably two for the very first time to make sure that they're absolutely safe. Um, 
badge number five, we're going to ask the, the team then, the skater and everyone else, to move to the barrier side of the rink. And we're going to make sure that they can demonstrate how to enter the rink safely and be on the rink surface for a few minutes using the relevant support. So at this stage, we're just navigating that process of taking them from the off ice to on the ice. And if you're dealing with a piece of kit, that can be quite a process because it's not just a matter of stepping on the ice to make sure that you're not stepping in anyone's way. You've actually got to make sure that you've got the equipment that it's going to be moving onto the ice or onto the, the rink surface, that it's not moving too much and that the person can actually get their balance and actually get onto the ice safely. So that I want you to make sure that that stage is absolutely safe before you actually take them any further. Badge number six, you've got them on the ice safely. Then you're going to actually see to what extent they've actually got some range of movement. Now, this um, process can actually even be used by someone in a wheelchair. So if you have a look at what um, we were asking them to do is imagine if you were in a wheelchair, you could ask them to bend the knees or move closer to the ice. So you're actually seeing if they've got any ability of their body to bring the body down. So that gives you an indication of how much core strength they've got. Then you're going to ask them to stretch their arms up or move their arms closer to the And Again, that's the ability to extend the muscles on the torso to see how much, what's the range of movement that they've got uh, upwards. And also what you want them to do is to stretch their arms out to the side. So you're giving this concept of how much of a range of motion have they got on both sides. And you'll be able to work out then how their balance is working. You've already tested it off the ice, but you then can test what's the impact of being on this blade or being on a moving surface. How does that impact on their ability to, to move their body and control it? Badge number seven, we, it's quite a long process. We go, we go to the stage of moving across the ice shrink surface for a distance of one meter. And the, we want to see that they can stop across the rink surface safely. Now, if you were, for example, someone that was in a wheelchair, you can see that we've not said that they've got to skate and then stop because they might be in a wheelchair. And so what you're do, dealing with there is you're dealing with the person that's in the wheelchair and the person that's assisting them, whether or not the person who's in the wheelchair can cope with the, and take the impact of being able to go forward and then brace themselves for the stopping action. And for someone that's got cerebral palsy, that can be quite um, quite a different feeling, you know, because you, what you don't want them to do is to have a um, loss of control and to, to rock their head and not have any control. So you need to make sure that they've got enough control of their heads to make sure that they can actually stop um, moving across the rink surface safely and that they can brace themselves. And if you've got any concerns about that, you would either mean that they couldn't skate or that you would have to make sure that you control the speed or alternatively that you've actually got you know, the support from the, the physio team to make sure as you've got on some of the equipment that these skaters have got, they've actually got something to actually to hold the, the torso and the head um, and give it adequate support. For badge number seven, we ask them to demonstrate knowledge of how to get up from a fall. Now, with someone that's, for example, with cerebral palsy, we're not asking them to get themselves up, but we do want to, to know that the team that are actually helping that skater know how they're going to get that person up from a fall so that they know how they're going to accommodate it. Hopefully it wouldn't happen, but say, for example, someone was using the frame and got knocked over. What do you need to put in place to get that person up safely? Um, or to be able to demonstrate knowledge of it. OK, if there was any risk of the skater falling, I wouldn't want them falling at all because I'd have them harnessed up and you put enough. We've never had someone that shouldn't fall falling at this stage because I put in so many safety precautions. But whatever happens, you need to have a plan in place so that if they were to have a fall, that they know how to what's going to happen and what you're going to do to be able to implement that process. For badge number eight, we're going to have them moving backwards across the rink. And again, that's the same thing. They can either do it if they're at the stage of doing it with, with their frame and they can do it on their own, then that's absolutely fine. They're just being asked to move across the, the rink surface for one meter. That would allow the people that are in a harness as well to do the same thing, uh, whatever type of equipment. It's them to be rotating to the left and rotating to the right. So again, that's basic control over the body. Badge number nine, we're wanting to see whether or not they can actually move towards the volunteer or the coach. And that's beginning to see whether or not they're really beginning to build up a relationship with the person that's helping them. And at this stage, we would also be hoping that they're beginning to have established such a relationship with the volunteer that they'll follow an instruction or they'll copy the movement of the coach. And if they do that, then we're going to, re to reward them. 
And it's not going to be one of the pre-prepared ones, it's the fact that they're actually going to do something in direct response to, to the coach. We're also hoping that they can demonstrate a swizzles movement. Standing still, now we've, we've skaters that have been in wheelchairs, we just get them to do this in the wheelchair, so they're turning their feet out and turning their feet in, so that you're asking them to do the same thing. And Olivia, I think you've attended some of the sessions where we've had Grant, and he really quite enjoys being asked to do the same as everyone else. So include them. They enjoy having something to do. When Grant's on the ice, I give Grant a task of we fist pump. So he's going to do right arm and move his arm to, to meet mine. And once he was able to do that, then he had to do fist pump right and fist pump left. So that he... It, you know, that you're always setting the goals for them, but you're setting them at a slightly higher level, but you're giving him a goal so that everyone should actually have a goal to, to, um, to achieve. And that would mean that the skaters, even if they're in a wheelchair, they still get asked to move and to be able to do these activities. Badge number 10, consecutive movement rotating to the right and then to the left. So that's going in one direction and then accommodating the change. And then moving forwards are stroking across the full width of the rink and the concept of a gliding movement where they're actually going to build up some speed and then just hold the position and have a glide standing still. So you can see that's tier one and you can see the difference in the, in the pace of progress between tier one and tier three is huge. Yeah. Um, for the skaters, once they've actually gone to this stage, what do they then go on to next? These skaters would be very much the ones who are at the BHF level one. So that, that would be the elements that they would be doing. And we would expect them to be doing that always with a frame of some type or some sort of balance facilitation. If they're in wheelchairs, then we've got the synchro events for them. So they can take part in synchro and that is at duets, trios, quartets and teams of different sizes. And those are the synchro elements so that there's always something for them to do. There's always the possibility that they're going to go up to tier two as well. Oh, good, okay. Well, well, that's. I'm going to end the recording because we've actually finished for today. So thanks to everyone on the recording.